our second speaker. He is a class chapter head of BCBP North. And he is also, bro, I also search you in the internet. He is also the class administrator of uh, the school doctors group of hospitals. Let us all welcome uh, Brother Oscar Guazzo.
Certo. Ok? So what is speech? Speech is man's faculty of oral communications where we express our By our speech, we express our thoughts, our ideas, our feelings, our emotions. And through our speech, we transmit our expressions of love, fear, trust, compassion, or anger, hatred, envy, jealousy, or distrust. Our speech can be either a, a tool for good or bad. We can make friends to the same extent. We can make enemies by the way we use our speech. Our words translate thoughts of our hearts. What comes out of our hearts usually gets out of us through our words. Behavioral patterns that harden into habits. You know, we do things repeatedly it becomes a habit pattern. Habits can either be good, like faith or joy, or bad ones, like depression or discouragement. The word we speak will either impact on people that we hear us, either to lift them up or even bring them down, to build up relationships or destroy relationships. God is so concerned about our speech because of His great power. In Proverbs, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death or life, death and life is in the power of the tongue. You know, the scripture is bereft with uh, a lot of verses comparing our speech, our tongue, with spiritual warfare uh, weapons. Okay. In Genesis, uh, let's start off with the, the power of the Word of God. When God created the world, all He did was say the Word. Let there be light, and there was light. Let the rivers, let the waters be teeming with light, and the fishes, and all the living creatures in the seas and the rivers came about. In Genesis 1-3, when He said, the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. God created the world from this world. And I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> our speech is vividly conveyed in Psalms and in Proverbs in terms of weapons of war. Sword, Proverbs 12. I'll just read a few, a few of those quotations from the Bible. Proverbs 12. The praying or the chatter while when talk of some men is like sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise is speedy. Some men is like sword thrust. And then in Psalm 64, who sharpens their tongue like sword. So brothers and sisters, the Bible is telling us that the tongue is a powerful word are fulfilled here to build up to destroy. In Psalms, the words also can damage like a spear or as arrows, as a war club, scourging fire, sharp razor. So you can see our words can be damaging because they our words are tongue is like likened to the sweetness of water. That's how powerful our tongue can be. Word would lead to destruction, as in Exodus 21. It says, whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Words can destroy, words can damage, and words can also heal. As in Psalm, Psalm 107, it says, 
healing comes from the Word of God. The next page, Psalm 107. He sent forth His Word to heal them and to snatch them from destruction. Much as words are powerful to damage, to destroy, they can also be powerful enough to heal, save us from destruction. The Word of God cuts through all human pretenses and reveals the true attitude of the heart, as in Hebrews 4.12. Indeed, God's Word is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates and divides, it penetrates and divides soul and spirit, joints and matter. It judges the reflections and thoughts of the heart. That's how sharp words can be penetrates and penetrates and even into the guts of our hearts. So brothers and sisters, the biblical teaching is very clear. Our speech has a tremendous potential for either good or evil, to build up or to destroy. The power of life and death that resides in our tongues applies both in our own lives and it can impact the lives of other people. Our words can lead us to the way of life. Mahina? Something's wrong with the microphone. Okay, thank you. Our words can lead us in the way of life or in the way of death, depending on how we say those words. Speech can be categorized into two. Speech that brings life, speech that gives life to others, speech that brings death. So we have to be careful on how we release those words. Let's talk about speech that brings death. These are called verbal aggressions. One, cursing. Cursing is calling upon a supernatural, supernatural power to bring harm to another. That's a curse. Reviling. Insulting or hurling verbal abuse at another. Is that the best that you can do? Can you not do anything better? That's an insult. Guile. Using deceitful or intimidating words to cloak malicious intents. Oh, it's Oscar. Si Oscar, that's a guile. Naro pa lang kailangan sa akin. He needs, he needed a favor. That's why he flattered me. He needs getting people in Oscar. I'm not sure him out of the no? False witness. Ah, this is very common in uh, courthouses. False witness means testifying falsely in court of law to harm another. I was asked at one time to be a witness, and I labeled myself a hostile witness. I was asked, I was asked to tell something else other than what really happened, and I said I cannot, I cannot speak other than the truth. So I was a hostile witness. Slander, speaking evil of another, usually to third parties. I think in a way. Slander, no? speaking evil of another, usually to a third party. But let's talk about slander a little bit more. Slander is malicious, false, and defamatory statement by oral utterance. It didn't mean that it all. Because if you write it, then that's not an evidence, no? With the intention of in, with the intention of damaging another person's reputation. The objective of slander is really to damage somebody else's reputation. Oftentimes, we may not know it, but we are doing just that. Uh, the, Greek, the Greek definition of, of slander, there are three of them, Kabbalastos, uh, Diabolos, Lastimia, in short, the slander is like an and evil deed, blaspheming the Lord. 
blasphemy, brothers and sisters, means an act of speaking against God or against that which is closely associated with Him. We blaspheme when we uh, when we talk about a good Lord, our God, in damaging ways. The scripture forbids us speaking of one another in a way that destroys the other's reputation or questions basic righteousness or confidence. In community, we, we are taught or made to believe that we should, not, we should only talk about Christ and speak to other people in a, an uplifting manner, not to put people down. That's what community is all about, to build each other up. Now, how do we respond to slander? Is there another way of handling the situation aside from slander? First one is if we hold a grievance against a person, we should only speak about it directly to the person concerned, but in front of the person. Don't go to one time. I don't know if there's still home radio, but one time people would say, okay, you can talk directly to the person. Okay. We should confront the person instead of going around, beating around the bush, involving other people who don't have any business, knowing about the situation. In Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17, says, if your brother should commit some wrong, if your brother should commit some wrong against you, go and point out his fault, but keep it between the two of you. Keep it between the two of you. You will gain respect of the other person. You will preserve his integrity, his respect, his reputation, and at the same time, by addressing it directly to the person involved, then chances are you will be able to resolve or correct the slanderous performance. Second, we should not listen to people speaking against others. I think it's, it's more like shop talk in the factory floor, for example. This is very prevalent. And what we're saying here, if you start to hear people talking about other people in a damaging way, I think as Christians, as Christians, we have the obligation to correct that evil doing. Now let me call, let me call something. This is an Irish philosopher. It says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women, if I may, not to do anything or to do nothing. If you hear slanderous performance of an individual and you're just listening to it, you become a part of the problem. You should be part of the solution that confront or stop the person at least in a brotherly way not to, not in a condescending way, but rather as, as a brother. Confront and stop that slanderous performance. We should not listen to people speaking against others. Some people just turn around and avoid conversation. But when we do that, brothers and sisters, chances are the situation will not be corrected. This person will continue to malign other people. It will not stop. Number three, avoid the company of those who regularly slander people. Would that solve the problem? Avoiding the company of regularly slandering people, or in a sense, we don't want to be associated with them. But at the same time, it's our Christian obligation to at least bring it up to their attention and hopefully they can correct together and correct that unacceptable behavior. Anyway, you look at it, it's a very serious scene. The 
slander is a very serious sin. They will damage the reputation of a brother or sister that's not amount of murdering, killing that person. Okay, that's uh, slander. Uh, my test. and invited and 
then gives out his own opinion of the subject he discussed and invited. Okay? This guy wants to be, is considered to be in the know. Gusto niya mapapakilala siya na he knows it all. The walk inside the video, he can do it. It's much possible we avoid engaging people like this. We know them. I think we can recognize them. And again, if somebody starts being at this body, then take the brother or sister aside, then confront and in a brotherly way explain to the person, you know, that be kind, stay away. We will ask for your help when we need you. I think that's the way of addressing you. We will ask for your help when we need you. So the third negative speech that we want to talk about is negative humor, sarcasm. Okay. It is funny, but it's made at someone's expense. Okay, when uh, I met my future father-in-law the first time, we just didn't know what he was getting. Another way of putting, talking about negative humor is making fun of someone's mistakes, weaknesses, or eccentricities. Making fun of someone's mistakes. Oh, if you want the business to succeed, go and you can see He knows of the business. That's negative humor. Sometimes used as a sign of affection and in fact this is an indirect personal correction. Well, the correction approach is there but it can be a sarcastic manner. This is a sign of weakness in our modern society. Lalo na ngayon with social media. Behind your back, and all of a sudden, it's popular as a Facebook, and you just you just don't know that your your reputation is, is on the line because because of social media. And this is what it means when it says it's a sign of weakness in our in our, in our modern society. Negative humor can become a habit. You need to do with it. Repeatedly, it becomes a habit, it keeps producing the same negative results. Our humor should be joyful and should be life giving. We should not make fun of brothers and sisters. Uh, sarcasm should, you can use sarcasm sometimes. I use sarcasm to effect good results. But you have to use it uh, in, in the, the right situation. Humor can be in God's service. If it's positive, joyful, and under control, then it can be, it can you know, it bring others to have a deeper relationship with, with the Lord. It can be used to foster relationships, but it has to be used selectively. We've talked about negative humor, we've talked about slander, gossip. So now we we'll talk about the opposite, how we can utilize this negative speech. These are called speech, speeches that will bring life. A, gracious speech, is speech that imparts grace, God's grace in our own. It lifts people up, it encourages people, it inspires people. It is constructive and full of substance. In Colossians 4, 6, it says that your speech be always gracious and in good taste and strive to respond properly to all who address you. It's intended to, to be given in good taste, to build you up, to encourage you. Okay. Speech that imparts grace in both God's grace and our own. It is constructive and full of substance, like the team is doing great or 
that DVD is up, for example. Okay, turnaround time is fantastic. Then the team needs to be given some kind of a race space. Great job, guys. Let's keep it up. Keep the momentum going. This is race space. Thank you for all your good work. Let's keep it up. It, it provides words of affection and concern. Greater speed strengthens personal relationships. One more example in workplace, for example, is this. If one of your employees would ask for a day off to take care of a sick sibling, for example, or a sick child, so the employee needs a day off. Okay? You grant the day off. The next time this employee of yours comes back, Raise speeds. Oh, how's your child? How's the hospital visit? How was the doctor's visit? You know, subliminally, but the boy of yours seemed, wow, I didn't realize that my boss cares about it. We have a saying in management people don't care how much you know whatever position you're in. People don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. People will care how much you know unless they know that you care. That's great to speak. Great to speak. Let's talk about the elements of great to speak. Great to speak should express praise and affection. It's absolutely. It's complementary, it's inspiring, it's encouraging. And not a good doubt. Okay? We should also correct with weakness of the program for praise and affection. Most scripture teaches us that we should be generous, even lavish in giving praise and expressing attention. The observation is this, most commonly, we are very slow to praise or to give, to give uh, affirmation. But we are quick, we are quick to, uh, let's say, criticize, that we are quick to go down. And the scripture tells us, that we should be more lavish in terms of giving praise and in, in encouraging people. What about correcting with weakness? We should not always be commending people, of course. There's a time when we should correct. Just because, I think as a behind the if your guy or your boy, for example, has been performing exceptionally well, then other boys come on. Then other boys, other boy. Then all of a sudden you reach one mistake. More often than not, that one mistake will wipe out the ten other boys. And this we have the one the one one mistake needs to be addressed and be corrected in a uh, in a proper manner. Employer, employee relations, for example, there's so of one on one. Communicating faith and joy. Our speech not only reflects how we are approaching our lives but the lives of others. If our speech is positive and life giving and filled with faith in God and joy in the Holy Spirit, then others will likewise be filled. Christian. And 
there we were enjoying our dinner, but at the same time we were sharing our faith with the Lord, laughing, laughing at each other because we would quote biblical verses, but we would not quote where they, they came from. But the mere fact that we, 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 if we can openly discuss our faith with other people, that in itself, that in itself is gracious speech, building people up. Making peace, conflict situations. A Christian and a woman should be strong, confident, able to avoid conflict without feeling fearful or intimidated. But at the same time, when conflict occurs, and sometimes there are inevitable, inevitable, then we should be Christian enough to confront it, to settle the issue. To the okay. Uh, there's a saying, don't let the sun set on any conflict. Don't set, don't let the sun set on your anger. When husband and wife, for example, this happened to us a number of times. My wife did that and I, when we were scheduled to give talks, for example, often enough, the devil must intervene, interfere. And conflict will arise. But knowing where the conflict is coming from, we may resolve to resolve the conflict for the glory of God because it's Him who serves, and we cannot go on serving without, without uh, resolving our, our conflict. Otherwise, we'll just be uh, saying just like the Sadducees without being told what they want to hear, but in the thin, they're doing something else. So we should be people of God, people who try to reject, to reject peace. Peace making, peace loving, peace giving. Courtesy. Courtesy is simply put in our conversations. We should show courtesy. How do we show courtesy? When somebody else is talking, he says, oftentimes, the meeting, when two or three people would like to talk, I'll talk each other, then uh, it's up to us to say, hey, there's only one conversation in a courteous way. Okay? Secondly, uh, we should not interrupt when somebody else is Talk. I was in a meeting uh, uh, the other day, then somebody else, the busy buddy, remember the busy buddy, a no all member of the, of the team, wanted to step in, interrupt as I was talking, and I said, in a nice way, this is my meeting, so I will just listen in a nice way. Okay? So, uh, to show courtesy means to respect, to respect another person. Gracious speech, we just talked about, now we talk about glorious speech. When we say about glorious speech, it speaks that we give glory to God, our boss. It builds up and strengthens human relationships and relationship with God. Conversation that we talk about literally invokes the presence of God. So it's just like if you you are in a conversation with the president is in your beach, you would show courtesy to the president and you will not say anything that would be detrimental to the president. That's the same way we have to contain our conversation in such a way that we build up the conversation. Uh, we you know we preserve the integrity of the people we're talking about and we're talking with. We can glorify God as follows. We praise God. Well, uh, Brother Mike has talked about Acts. Acts A, the adoration is praising God. He deserves it. He deserves all the praise and glory that is due him. So we can glorify God by praising him. Thank God. The Bible reminds us that 
we should thank God in any circumstances that we, uh, that we get into. Thank God for everything. I get involved in the orientation and training of new professionals in the hospitals. I ask each one of them each time, what do you do the first, what do you do first thing in the morning when you wake up? I got, I always got uh, very responses. One of you I'll check my messages in the cell phone. I go to the bathroom. Then a few of them would say, I thank God for giving me a life for the night and for waking me up. And that's very appropriate, brothers and sisters. We thank God. Every circumstance, every manner, every way we can. Okay? Call it upon the Lord. How many of us will call upon the Lord only as a last resort? The Lord should be our first resource, not the last resort. Okay? Uh, like uh, uh, staff of mine also called me up a few weeks ago, asking me to intervene for a daughter and they have medicine. Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. 
in public like that. Okay? So it takes a prayer life, a life in reading the scripture, a life that's been wrapped with frequency, frequency in the sacraments. That should be our lifeblood. So people will, will know that we are in love with our God. By the way we live, by what? By the way we talk. Okay? So, going back to the initial biblical statement, by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. You don't have to be an eloquent speaker like Paul, or rather Mike, or the other members, leaders of our community, but you can do so, proclaim without even speaking a word, by the way you live your life. And this is accentuated by the way the matter of speaking. If all words come that come out of our mouth, it's all glorifying and gracious, up, that they will know that they are Christians. Why not? People will say, I want something that brother has. And that's the best that's the one of you as a Christian. There's another biblical verse which is which says, if you acknowledge me before men of earth, this is Jesus telling us, if you acknowledge me before men of earth, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me here on, before men here on earth, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. I think that should be the most damning word that you can give from our constitution. So brothers, let's take care of our child, Jesus Christ. Now we go to wrongdoings. Before we talk about correcting wrongdoings, let's first talk about what are wrongdoings. Oftentimes we make a mess of our personal relationships without recognizing that we are doing something wrong. Because in very sadly, we don't know that we're doing it, but it's affecting our relationship with others. We find ourselves wrong by others. And they are unknowingly doing the same. Okay? Many of our problems with other people are the result of misunderstanding. Typically, in another political context, oh, my, my speech was taken out of context. They misunderstood me. They mistreated me. Okay? So, we have to be cognizant of this. Common and incorrect ways of handling wrongdoings. These are subtle ways, sometimes of avoid the person wrong. Let sleeping go slide. I don't know if I don't think I'm not seeing it. Oh, but I did not know. Wrong. Pretend it did not happen. Oh, can you know? Oh, can you let go? Okay? Try to be a Oh, you let that go. Oh, you let that go. Oh, you let that go. Dress today. Pero, yesterday, I stopped him in the back. I did a wrong thing. I don't know if I had that go. Pretend that it didn't happen. I'm extra nice to him. And then hopefully, hopefully, hindi nila manotis na ginawak ko na yun. Those are subtle ways of avoiding wrongdoings. But the Christian way of handling wrongdoings is this. The Christian way solves the problem. Doesn't just sugarcoat it, doesn't fit around the most. It repairs the wrongdoings that is broken and be fixed. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. No. Broken, it can be fixed. Repentance and reconciliation will prepare the wrongdoing. And this the way Christian way handling wrongdoings, they do the job for which they were designed. First of all, you must understand what wrongdoings are before we discuss or we even attempt to repair the wrongdoings. Wrongdoings refer to our actions and attitudes which are not important. That's expressed here. We do things that are not in conjunction with or in congruence with that skill for us and for our brother and sister. A wrongdoing can be serious. Wrong 
doing any serious act, murder, adultery, or it can be minor petty theft, invasion of someone's privacy. These are minor wrongdoings. Where did wrongdoings come from? Did that you make me do it? Original sin. Okay? It began with man's rebellion against God and God's way of doing things. Why? Because God wanted to become a man, wanted to become man. And the answer to that is to get the God to God. He's good at it. He's been doing it even before the world began. He will continue to do it even after the world disappears. Let God be God. Misconceptions about wrongdoings, temptations, some are wrongdoings. Every sin is preceded by temptation. But temptation is not a sin by itself. But if you, if you act on it, then it becomes a sin. It becomes a wrongdoing. Emotions, to be angry, for example, that's not a sin. It's not a wrongdoing. But if you act out of anger, for example, Kill somebody because you are so angry and you are so red faced, that becomes wrongdoing. But what mistakes? Oh, it gives us a guilt, guilt conscience. But mistakes are not wrongdoing. They're not sinful. But we, we recognize those are just mistakes. The one we may may uh, uh, common uh, alibi. Oh, you know, to err is human. You know, I'm just humans. I make mistakes. Yeah, as long as we can recognize that the mistake is done, and then we make an attempt to correct it, okay, it's okay to make a mistake, but to make an habit out of making mistakes, we have to correct it. And my new brothers and sisters, correction, excellence usually comes out after correcting mistakes. Now, what to do to repair the wrong the wrong that we have done, one, first of all, we have to admit that we did something wrong. First step towards correction is to admit that there was something wrong that was committed. Renounce it. Firm decision that you don't want any part of it. No, no. Something you don't want. It was a mistake. I'm sorry. That's the third one. Be sorry for the wrong doing. I'm sorry that it happened. Uh, I will not do it again. Reconciliation, just expressing your sorrow for doing such a thing and uh, making the uh, resolve, making the promise not to do it again, but it's very difficult. How many times have you confessed the same sin over and over? It's very difficult. And make restitution. Uh, my classic example of this is a penitent, but confession, go to the father. I know my sin is this. I, I stole a piece of rope. He said, oh, my son, he says, yes, mother, that's all, that's all my sin. Okay, for your penance, you say, free our fathers, and then return the rope. It's right for honor. So the penitent went out the confession of happy, 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 because he, at the end, the rope was a car so he was made to return the rope, but he can't care about it. Is he paying that? Did he make restitution? No, he did not. Conclusion, the scripture calls us to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We also need to love with our tongue and actions. Both our tongue and our actions, which can speak louder than words, are a gift from God and with tremendous power and ability, able to speak words of salvation and build up people of God in love. Brothers and sisters, as I speak these gifts with respect, they deserve and devote them to the service of the merciful giver. I want to leave these this few words with you to end up my, uh, my talk. This is from uh, a French philosopher. By the name of uh, hmm, Gile, Etienne Gile, and he says, We only pass this way but once, but any good deeds, any good words that we can say, do or say, do it or say it right now, because we can never pass this.